Hello, class. Good morning. Uh, welcome to uh, second lecture of polymer physics class. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Shadangu again. Uh, nice to see everybody virtually online. And uh, today I'm going to discuss about uh, some of the fundamentals about length scale and statistic of polymer chain. And as I mentioned, that the class will be a combination of online teaching and uh, live um, Zoom meeting. So we will see each other again every day in the lecture time so that we can engage each other about questions. Um, like I mentioned that I have been able to record all the previous lectures online. So those are valuable information for everybody to see that and use them as a learning resource for you. They are freely available on the YouTube. So you can uh, feel free to go in and look into these previous lectures. I saw that every time every single lecture you teach will be slightly different. That's the same in my class. So I bet if you go into those classes, you're going to learn quite a lot as well. Uh, most of the class actually are recorded quite perfectly. So you can just uh, go in and uh, start watching those videos as a warm up for the lecture. So for today's lecture, um, I think I want to give an overview about um, the chapter six from this um, well-written book from the Ting Lodge, discussing about the conjugate, uh, not conjugated polymer, but generally the polymer chain conformation. And why we need to learn chain conformation? And what can we do with this information? I would argue this is a sort of uh, one, two, three, those are fundamentals in the polymer science when you want to do advanced data analysis. These are one, two, threes, so that you need to learn those basics so you can go to more advanced one. Um, let me open the textbook and do a few introduction about what this chapter will cover. So if you open the book, um, we're going to see that at the beginning, we're going to give an uh, overview of the lecture. So this is going to be chapter 6.1, discussing about the conformation, bond rotation, as well as polymer size. After that, we're going to talk about a very important parameter in um, polymer physics is the concept of end-to-end -end distance. This is the idea that has been widely used to quantify the coil size of your polymer. So you can think about end-to-end -end distance is a rough measure how big your coils are. Like if you want to talk about a car, a ship, you always talk about how big it is, right? So similarly, the end-to-end -end distance will tell you if my molecular is bigger than yours or if mine is smaller than yours. So this is a quite important. Next, we're going to talk about characteristic ratio and static statistical segment lens. Those two parameters are very much related and this will help us to understand how big these um, chains are and how rigid these chains are and how can you convert a uh, not free jointed chain to a free jointed chain. Those details about chain model we're going to all cover in this lecture. Then we're going to go into a little bit more uh, specific case about semi-flexible chains. So those are called worn-like chains. They are not necessarily like the conventional material. So it requires a unique treatment and has some different results you will see from this lecture. Then we will talk about some more important parameter, not just end-to-end -end distance, but some parameter called radius of gyration. Those two parameters are very much uh, related. So you can convert one into the other very easily. And we will talk about different spheres, rods, coil, and how these would be related to each other. Last but not least, all these, have what we talked about is related to a single chain. So we're going to also talk about how to understand statistics of these chains. And specifically, how you understand uh, a bunch of chain with with a, a very fraction of those molecular at a given moment, okay? Not the average version, even the same polymer chain, it's mobile, it's changing its conformation, for example, in solution all the time. So what you are measuring is not gonna be uh, 
you know a, a single chain but always going to be an average of multiple chain and these multiple chain also represent what happens for a chain over a period of time and all, all those discussions are based on the assumption that your polymers are basically is um, is ideal chain that means this is in uh, not real case but happens in for example imagine your chains is in the vacuum and your chains can overlap each other it's a good model to start but it's not necessary the best uh, um, results would match what a real chain is like so we're gonna go into those details so after about a month, you would expect you would be able to learn all these fundamental concepts and actually give a very, very good um, explanation of different chain confirmation, etc. So I hope you all will do well in the class. So let's get started with the first part. So the first part of the polymer is talk about what are the polymers at nanoscopic scale and how these nanoscopic scale would impact your your macroscopic property. Let me give you an example that um, everybody probably uh, had some pasta before. This is a classic example that relate to the chain confirmation. So uncooked pasta coming from out of package is a basically like a rod or like a stick. It's very rigid and it doesn't have many bending along backbone. But once they're being cooked, when they are served, then you wouldn't necessarily would pull every single pasta back to its straight form. That would be crazy and I wouldn't do that. So those pasta will be in a random conformation and they are likely also entangled with each other. So if you pull one pasta out of the dish, they are likely to be neighboring pasta coming out of it. So this is very much related to what we're going to talk about today is how does the polymer chain would resemble those pastas and how does your polymer confirmation would change. Um, let me begin by saying that unless you have some really unique treatment like tensile jaw or other process to make those polymers chains uh, aligned otherwise they would always take some sort of coil state and specifically for this particular part of the first two chapter of the class we're only going to discuss about the polymer chains that are coiled so what do I mean by coiled let me look around my my room for example I can find uh, a cable coming from my charger okay this is a, a charger but imagine that they're going to be taking a random coil shape look like this. So it is not a strain chain, but it's not like um, super uh, random coil. See what in my hand. So those type of confirmation will dictate their um, final property. Okay. And let's get started into a little bit more detail. So first question I want to ask everybody to do an exercise in your mind is when I speak about polymer, can you guess how big those polymers would be? Let me give you an example about, um, think about polyethylene. This is probably one of the most well-known polymer. And if you consider high density, high density polyethylene, low density polyethylene, Combine them together, they represent the 50% of world production of plastics. So I assume everybody has some point to use those kind of plastics. And my question to you is, if I have a polymer that has molecular weight of 280 kilodalton, or you can use the other term, 280 thousand um, grams per mole, so how does this chain would uh, look like in, in, in a nanoscopic scale? And what, uh, what other property can be linked to that? So in order to understand that, we need to consider two things. Is first is, you know, you can convert those kind of polymer chains into, mm, into a certain molecular weight. And the molecular weight I already talked to you about, 
Imagine that there is 280 kilodalton. If you know that you you are aware the polymer is usually polymerized monomer. If you get some idea about how big these monomers are, you would be able to calculate about a parameter, and it is very important parameter called degree of polymerization. So if you use the whole polymer molecular weight divided by its monomer molecular weight is 28, you can get that there's about a thousand um, repeating unit. For example, what we have show here, you can, you can have about a thousand monomer there, and that's a very important information because everybody knows that the higher the degree of polymerization, the longer the polymer chains will be. So using a very simple mathematics, if we know that carbon, carbon, this is assuming these uh, 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 gray balls are carbon, so you can get how long those carbons are. So the distance from one carbon to another carbon is known from the chemistry that each carbon-carbon bond is measured at 0 0.154 nanometer or you can also call it 1.54 angstroms. So this is pretty short. So that's how you measure, uh, that's how how far apart those carbon carbons are. And now considering that all these carbon carbon bonds adopt something called sp3 bonds because one carbon is always connected with four different elements around it. So uh, polyethylene that means one carbon is connected with two carbon on each side. So imagine here, this would be another carbon, this would be the second carbon. And now think about that each carbon would have two hydrogen coming from here again. And you can um, use model and actually know what would be the bond angles are. And for um, C sp3 um, hybridization, the bond angle is given by the uh, one point, uh, 109.5 degrees. So based on this angle, then you can basically calculate out what it would be the fully extended the chain along its backbone using a simple triangle equations show us here. So you can see this would be the C and this would be A and this would be B because A and B are the same so we can apply this very simple mathematics to get how long your polymer chains will be fully extended, right? So if we don't consider any angle, then if this bond can be fully flexible, then you can actually pull the chain directly straight. So you can use a number of monomers multiplied by each monomer. You have two carbon bonds, so two multiplied by 10,000 will give you 20,000 amount of carbon carbon bonds along your polymer backbone. Multiply by amount of uh, distance between two carbons, that will give you about 30 microns. The, sorry, 3 microns, not 30 microns. It's about 3 microns for those um, fully stretched chain. But if you also consider the uh, limitation of the bond, then this distance will drop slightly because we are effectively bending the, the angle back so that you have a little bit shorter distance. So this is what happens if you have a polymer chain that is have that much monomers, okay? So we know that it's about uh, when it's fully stretched, that's, it is about three microns, but in many cases, as I mentioned, like you cooking pasta. Once it's being flexible chain, you would not necessarily have all the chain adopting like straight, straight, straight chain along its backbone. So you always have something like the coil. So imagine now you have a garden hose or a bunch of wires that are flexible. You lift it up, it's gonna be a very straight chain, right? Because gravity is gonna pull it, so you're gonna have a straight chain and the fully extended lens is has a term called a contour lens. So this lens is what we have just discussed is the lens between one end of the chain to the other end and this is called contour lens, okay? So 
we're going to discuss a little bit more detail in later part what is contour lens are but you got the idea so where i drop the chain to the floor you can think about this is a, maybe a cotton coil when it drops down that will be forming a you know a bundle of coils sitting on the ground and the shape of them will be pretty random and you will guess they will take a coiled states and the coiled states is very much related to uh, how rigid those chains are. If it's a rigid rod, it's going to just fall down and become a straight line again. If it's, uh, it's, if it's uh, semi-rigid, then part of it may be banded, right? So this we're going to also discuss. Okay, so this is an example we just discussed. A better way to calculate is called a contour lens. And everybody knows contour lens, this term is defined as how big your polymer chains are when you fully stretch it. So fully stretch it. And this will be determined by repeating units. And this, in our example, because each monomer has two bonds, so you have 2 multiplied by n will be number of carbon bonds. L is a bond length, is what we have defined. L would be equals to 0 0.154 nanometer. And sine, sine uh, theta divided by 2 would be the angle between them. And what, this is what we talked about. So here we showed the example how big the polyethylene chain would be. Okay, in terms of contour length. So very simple equation we can get using the molecular weight we have shown above and then divided by the um, uh, repeating unit molecular weight. So this will give you a number n. n would be the, uh, n would be, um, the uh, degree of polarization. Here we had a little typo, so this should be read at 280,000 instead of 298, okay? Um, and you can use the equation above to calculate out what would be the contour lens as we show above. Again, 2 is basically for each repeating unit. You have two carbon-carbon bonds. You multiply bonds, multiply angle. This will be giving you the contour lens, okay? Now, how about in the other extreme, when we talk about one extreme is fully straight polymer chain, the other extreme will be we fully compact it. What that means is I'm going to take this as a polymer chain. I'm going to squeeze as tight as possible. How do we get how big the volume of this will be? And this will be the smallest volume your polymer chain could occupy. Okay, and this is given by if we know the density of your material, we know how heavy they would weight, and then we can use a, a approach as show here, where you can use a molecular weight multiplied by uh, uh, inverse of density multiplied by Avogadro constant. So this will give you how much space actually a single chain would occupy. Okay. So this tells you if I have one chain of what you show above is 280 kilodalton, that I would have a polymer chain occupying a volume of 4.9 multiplied by 10 to the minus 19 centimeter cubic. And we know that if we calculate out the volume would be equals to um, Three, 4 divided by 3 multiplied by pi and r in cubic. And you can calculate this r would be 4.7 nanometer. Okay, that would be the radius of your solid bowl there if you have a polymer strand. It's quite amazing, right? Think about the length scale we talked about. This is 2.5 micrometer. This is 4.7 nanometer. So that's roughly about a, old, uh, a, a thousand times difference, three orders magnitude. So this would equal to, if you have imagined there's 200 feet strands of hair, that how big that, this is very long. 
And if they call into itself, it would actually make a sphere only a size of a baseball. So that's how big a polymer chain would, uh, would change its conformation depending on what condition they're in. From very big to very small, it's a huge difference. The other um, example I'll give you is think about another is baseball size versus football field. So that's a huge difference in terms of how much confirmation it would adopt. And as you can imagine, the confirmation would also impact how they behave uh, macroscopically. If they're in a good shape, a good solvent or poor solvent, that would determine how they would behave, okay? And now going back to more realistic state is those chains would for uh, something called a Gaussian coil. So this would resemble how a polymer chain would behave when it's fall down to the ground and show a random coil state. And this, I can give you a, a little bit heads up. So this would be roughly about 15 nanometer for a coil the size, if you consider end-to-end -end distance. So this is a bigger than the ball, but not as big as what you get from the contour lens. So right somewhere in between is what the polymer would adopt its uh, conformation. And this would be the case for any polymer if they are not being specially treated inside any plastic product. Okay. So now you guys get some ideas about how big the polymer chains are and uh, how different confirmation they might have. How to approach this is a question that bothers all the polymer scientists. So to make the problem very simple, we usually start with something called ideal polymer chain. So ideal chain is a unique case where assumes your chain don't have any long range interaction. What that means is your chain, one, one side of the chain and to the other side, they're treated as very similarly. There is no difference between two and they wouldn't um, step on each other and they don't see each other. This is very strange. If you think about what this basically says in the human language is the polymer chain can sit on the top of each other, occupy the same space twice, if that sounds crazy to you, it is for me. Under this assumption that you can actually get a very simple model using some, uh, s uh, some uh, ideas we're going to talk about later called um, Gaussian coil. And this Gaussian coil can be related to another very common problem called random walk. So we're going to go back to the random work and continue to discuss about that in the later lecture. But for now, we're just going to say this allows us to ignore many complicated physics problems, but we only take the essence of how a polymer chain would behave is to make it and think about it as an um, ideal chain. Okay? So this idealized is uh, very useful to make our data easy to treat. Um, actually, although this is an ideal model, but this is also can be found in real case. What is the case when you think about a polymer chain can be modeled as what we call ideal chain? There's a couple cases. First is a polymer melt. So for a polymer melted and there's a chain occupying the similar region with its uh, same polymer as a neighbor. So due to the screening interactions, the polymer actually would behave just like ideal chain. Also in concentrated solution and there's also a unique condition called SEDA temperature. And we will cover that in the later on stage. But in dilute solution, in good solvent, your polymer chain cannot ignore something called a self-avoiding effect because the chain cannot occupy the same space twice, so you always need to have the chain avoiding itself, causing the problem we call the self-avoiding cases. Okay? Um, 
This should give you some good idea how to think about a polymer chain and where to get started. And a lot of factor would impact how your chain would behave. And a simple case I want to remind everybody would be a vision that you dissolve a single chain in a solvent. They mimic something like we talked about. Although it's not in the vacuum, uh, like the ideal chain would basically, you can think about a chain as uh, self-floating in the, in the vacuum. It's sort of something you can think about universe is where you would be, there's no gravity, something floating around. But the difference is again, in the solvent, your polymer solvent have the interaction. Depend on if it's good solvent, poor solvent, or theta solvents, you would have um, polymer chain behave in the swollen states, Gaussian coil states, or clapped states, basically something related to what we talked about in the first case, how much volume your chain would occupy if it's collapsed. Okay? Um, the last but not least, we will also discuss that solvent and polymer would interact and this would also impact your polymer behavior. And we will leave that to a later part of the lecture. Okay, so um, I'm going to just uh, briefly introduce the chain confirmation part for the details we're going to discuss later. So for the chain confirmation, now imagine this would be your polymer chain from left to right, this would be one carbon-carbon bond, second and third, and there's many bonds along the polymer chain. And this would impact how these theta angle, if you have a certain limitation, for example, your carbon-carbon bond, this theta angle is fixed at 109 degree, and you cannot change it, right? And there is also something called dihedral angle, is where, think about, this bond is fixed, but this bond can rotate around in plane. Um, I'll get a model um, built usually. I gave it to the class to show them how this polymer chain is actually work. And this model is should still be in the student's bullpen. If you have um, access to the building, you can go in and play with the model and you can see how these chains can rotate along this carbon and you can basically pull this back and forth. So to sum up all these covalent bonds, rotation, um, intermolecular interaction, all gonna change your chain conformation. So keep in mind that to make the thing simple, we're gonna start with the most simple case is just consider there's no restriction in the bond angle, there's no restriction in the dihedral angle, and this would call the our polymer is a uh, free joint chain. And what free joint chain says is basically your chain is, is free jointed. It's a free joint. It can do anything, any angle. So my joint, like here, for example, my R, here, think about its joint. I can only bend in this way, and this is a certain restriction in the angle. And I can rotate in plane because there's another rotation I have. But imagine that I can go any direction. That would be called a uh, random uh, coil or free joint chain. So we're gonna discuss more detail about this free joint chain because this is fundamental of all the discussion we're gonna do for the next months. So with that, I'm gonna um, recap and finish today's class. So today's class is just a, some basic introduction to show you guys how how polymer coil would behave and how does um, different bond angle, rotation angle would define your roughly restricting your point core size as well other parameter. And coming back to the topic, uh, to the next lecture, the first thing we're gonna discuss is free joint chain where you have no limitation in the bond angle, no limitation in the dihedral angle this is a very much an idealized chain model, but it is very useful for polymer physicists to understanding um, the property they behaved. Okay, with that, thank you, and uh, I'll see you uh, for the live session later on.